Okay, so Courtney's provided a very good introduction to sickle cell disease and what we're up to at the NIH. And so I'm just going to extend this to the gene therapy uh, setting a bit and just remind you that um, the way we're going about doing this is to either replace the bone marrow stem cells that make all the components of the blood uh, shown here in this cartoon, or in fact repairing them by adding a copy of the correctly spelled gene back to those bone marrow stem cells. So I'm talking to you about the panel on the right now, bone marrow transplant coming from the patient's own bone marrow, as Courtney uh, described briefly just a moment ago. And for that, we've principally relied on viral vectors based on viruses in nature that naturally integrate themselves into our DNA. And we can hijack those vectors, those viruses to form vectors to transfer uh, the correctly spelled beta globin gene. And so one thing that I was asked to comment on is how do you pick the dose to move forward? And we heard uh, Kathy High talk about that this morning. But another way to do that was actually in our ongoing clinical trials. Courtney mentioned that we had some patients who, despite having a graft, initially lost that graft, and we could watch the graft go away over time. So we can measure the amount of donor in their blood uh, uh, in the white cell compartment and quantitate that over time and then look at their red cells to see that they're still normal. And what we found, Courtney already mentioned, was that so long as they were above 20% of their white blood cells coming from donor, they had red blood cells completely coming from donor. And when they crossed that line, we started seeing hemoglobin S increase. These patients all had sickle trait donors, so they started going above 50% when they crossed that 20% mark. And um, we uh, got with Stefan Cordes, who's a mathematician now retraining uh, in hematology to develop a mathematical model uh, to model these data, and we saw that this was all due to differences in lifespan and that 20% was indeed the mark, the blue line, uh, showing the predicted values uh, superimposable over the red line, which is the measured uh, values. So we only need 20% to fix this disease. That's very important to know in gene therapy. We need to know what the target amount is so that we know once we get there, we can move to clinical trials. Okay, so the next question, which I made as my first question, wasn't one that I was asked, but one that I encountered in the course of this, and that is, how do we introduce the experimental vector? I've told you we use HIV-1 as the backbone for the vector to transfer these cells, transfer the gene to these cells. So we make that into a Trojan horse and move the gene into the hematopoietic stem cell. But you have to understand that patients with sickle cell disease with confronted with our experimental vector, HIV, uh, may think back on the Tuskegee experiments when they're in a government hospital uh, in which you know uh, the PHS sponsored a trial looking at um, uh, following individuals with syphilis over a lifespan to see what the complications were without treating them even during the period when penicillin was available. So uh, this is kind of a crazy idea to be introducing to patients. And the bottom line is that it takes a lot of education in the patient population and long-term follow-up of patients uh, in a setting where they are getting uh, care uh, from, from physicians that they trust. So how do we determine that the first trial patients get a potentially therapeutic dose? That was another question that was posed. And that's really shown here. Uh, through doing repeated testing in cells and small animals, and again, I want to reiterate the importance of the large animal model. We started, or Cindy Dunbar, who you heard from this morning, started gene transfer trials uh, 25, 30 years ago, and those trials were based on the available data in mice, and that predicted that it would work. But unfortunately, there was a big disparity between what was seen in the mouse models, at least for hematopoietic stem cells as targets, and what was seen in the initial human trials. And those were mirrored, in fact, by the large animal models. So we did a lot of work in large animals. And this is a big arrow backwards because we spent most of our time going backwards until we finally hit the 20% mark uh, long-term in animals. And we started a study with Bluebird Bio. This is the Bluebird Bio-sponsored trial that's now open in many centers. Uh, we started this when there were about 10 people uh, in adults with severe disease, as Courtney um, mentioned earlier. This was primarily a safety study, but we had key efficacy endpoints. And the next way to make sure that it works is to pay attention 
while you're going. So we're looking at the results in real time and then making adjustments. And we made three adjustments. We had group A, where we were taking bone marrow using the old transduction methods. In group B, we started collecting backup with a mobilization agent, Plorexifor, that we thought would be safe in this disease and refined the manufacturing procedures. And then in group C, we used the mobilization and the refined manufacturing procedures. All these groups with a handful of patients. And here you can see, <laughs> sorry, that the refinements during this um, protocol actually helped. So you can see vector copy number going up to around four. That's four copies of the gene per cell with these improvements. The percentage of the cells having a copy going from 20 to 80 <laughs> percent. And finally, with the mobilization, we were getting a lot more cells uh, to put in the patient. So six and a half million versus about two per kg. And this resulted in, in improvements in what we saw in the patient. So you can see in group A, we had a modest effect around 7% um, uh, at the long-term follow-up of vector uh, derived hemoglobin <coughs> of hemoglobin uh, coming from vector. Uh, even at um, nine months post-transplant, that in group, improved in groups B and C to about half uh, the uh, hemoglobin. So these patients now look like sickle cell trait in group C. And we took a modest improvement from group A and, and, and changed that to a, a very real and um, what looks more like a curative uh, uh, transplant uh, by group C in the, same, in the course of the same clinical trial. So I was given several other questions uh, to consider. How do we enroll pre-symptomatic uh, patients? And that's something that we've struggled with. We've moved now in the matched sibling transplant uh, protocol since we know it works so well. Thank you. We can begin to relax the stringent inclusion criteria, but I think in the gene therapy setting, we're not there yet. We need to know what's working. We need to quantitate the benefit in patients for whom the risk-benefit uh, favors the intervention. So um, someone whose uh, risk of their current disease is more than what we know about the transplant. And then once we have de-risked the procedure itself or had the uh, uh, success known, we can begin to apply that in the pre-symptomatic patients. So for gene therapy, we're not there yet. So how do we follow up participants on the results of clinical trials? This is a very important point that we often miss. So we enroll patients in clinical trials. We have the results. We present them at meetings. We come to meetings like this, but we forget to loop in the, the patient participants. So that's a very important piece um, that uh, I think we have to get better at doing. So we go to patient advocacy meetings now. We actually have a meeting in our clinic where we update patients on what's available to them and what the results are of our currently uh, ongoing trials. So I think that's also very helpful uh, to engage the patient population as, as, as real uh, team members in this effort. And then the question that's bubbled up multiple times that we'll have a chance to talk about in the afternoon too, what if you get gene therapy, it doesn't work, and you do it again? Cindy mentioned that we collect uh, uh, a backup product. That's certainly a potential um, for a second attempt. One of the things that we do is we try to hedge our bets. So if a patient looks like they're um, uh, in pretty good shape and could undergo uh, something like this gene therapy approach, maybe they could uh, enroll in this therapy first, that doesn't preclude, for example, the matched sibling or the haploidentical uh, transplant as a second option should it not work. So we've been navigating in that way. But that also, now that these other therapies are working, complicates things because you have one protocol that's working, another protocol that's working. We don't really have the long-term follow-up to know if one is better than the other. So it, it, it becomes a little complicated. Um, and maybe we'll have some more time to talk about that. So what about gene editing? So all of us are really exciting that we can use these new uh, gene editing techniques to fix the misspelled uh, gene in sickle cell disease or perhaps reactivate fetal hemoglobin. We know nature's done this experiment for us. There are patients who are born with mutations in genes that cause them not to switch off fetal hemoglobin. That's called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. If they also inherit sickle cell disease, they're fine. So in this case, 
Nature has done an experiment already for us. And if we could just recapitulate that by cutting a gene with CRISPR, for example, that suppresses fetal hemoglobin, perhaps we could treat the disease. Or maybe we could even fix the misspelling. So we've been using CRISPR-Cas9 because it's easy to use. It arose from basic studies of bacteria, which is another reason to support basic research. These people had no idea what this would lead to. They just wanted to know how bacteria fight viruses. And it turns out this system can be trained to cut DNA wherever we want and can increase the chance that we repair that DNA using the cell's own machinery if we put a correctly spelled segment of the gene in with that um, system. So this is kind of like the find and replace on your word processor. Um, and it actually works uh, quite well. I'll just show you a little example uh, in a moment. But it's easy to get, as I mentioned. You can even get it on Amazon. You can do uh, home experiments. Uh, it's pretty cheap. This individual kit is 169 bucks on Amazon. And if you have Amazon Prime, you can uh, get it uh, shipped to your house tomorrow for free. And um, that's kind of the way it works in the lab. We order it. We get it the next day. We can start doing these experiments. In this case, we're cutting the sickle cell uh, uh, mutation. We put a cheat sheet in there, um, we're calling it donor DNA in this, in this figure, with the correct spelling. And one of three things can happen. It can go back to the sickle mutation. It can just be cut and not repaired. Or it can be cut and subsequently repaired. The third option, of course, is the most difficult one. So we've been working to try and look at different methods for doing this. We can get CD34 cells from patients. We can do this correction. Then we can grow them and culture out to red cells. And then we can look at the red cells to see if they have the correct protein now, the correct hemoglobin, and, and, um, and see how close we are to this 20% mark that I've showed you that we need to reach. Uh, to fix the disease. And right out of the gates, we're at 30%. So these are some different conditions that don't seem to matter much. We get about 30% correction of the mutation and about 60% cutting of the gene. So these will actually not contribute to red cells because they've had their beta globin disrupted. They'll have chain imbalance and they'll behave like a thalassemia and not make red cells. So when they have 10 to 20% of the hemoglobin S left to compete with the corrected cells, and so we can grow red cells and make a pellet, spin them down, look at the protein, and this is just an example of that. Uh, you can see the nice red cells in the pellet there. And we can do a hemoglobin electrophoresis. In the no electroporation lane, you see the hemoglobin S band there. And in the four subsequent lanes that have been electroporated and treated with either cast. Uh, Cas9 mRNA or protein, we get pretty robust correction. Almost all of the hemoglobin in these red cells is normal hemoglobin now. We can confirm that and quantitate it by reverse phase HPLC. This is a more sophisticated method to do the same thing that I just showed you in the last slide. And we can quantitate that. Now you see uh, in red the amount of beta globin versus beta S and a little bit of gamma globin that we get in culture. The majority of the globin in, this, in these red cells now are the correctly spelled beta globin. And this is far in excess of the 20% uh, that we need uh, to fix this disease. So now we can even start to contemplate whether gene editing is a potential strategy uh, in this disease. So how will gene editing technologies be received by the stakeholders? We've already seen, you know, a, 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 a lot of questions uh, surrounding the use of HIV to transfer uh, the gene to the hematopoietic stem cells. What about you know messing with our DNA and respelling it? There's been you know a lot of pushback, um, and actually Vince Bonham, who's in the audience, who can who can um, weigh in in the discussion session, um, did a very important study where they. Uh, they provided an educational video, two-part survey, in 15 moderated focus groups in seven U.S. cities that were recorded so they could really get the complexities of the discussions. And they found you know, that p patients were actually really interested in this technology. Uh, motivators included the hope in the technology, altruism, as Courtney mentioned, uh, the shortcomings of the current treatment, and the increased awareness of the importance of clinical trials. Deterrence included uncertainty about the consequences when you go in and start changing DNA, the permanence of the change. You're going to change my DNA forever. Uh, 
um, and the trial burden, which is true for all transplant studies, um, an inherent mistrust of the medical community that's um, present, especially in the sickle cell disease population because of what they face on a daily basis with this disease, reproductive risk and lack of access. Mediators included religiosity, as Courtney mentioned, capacity to manage their disease in life post-treatment. And, of course, they wanted more specific details, expected interpatient variability, um, information about optimal timing, and what is the track record of this uh, potential new therapy. And just a word about somatic versus germline. So we're talking about somatic cell gene therapy, gene editing. And in sickle cell disease, we have the benefit of being able to take out the diseased organ uh, and change it in a way, add a gene, correctly spell the gene, and put it back. We're not talking about germline um, gene editing, which is what all the fuss has been about recently, uh, especially since a Chinese investigator reported that he had indeed uh, done germline uh, gene editing in a, in a set of twins uh, in China. And, you know, the NIH uh, came out with a statement, and these are Francis Collins' words, let Lest there be any doubt, and as we previously stated, NIH does not support the use of gene editing technologies uh, in human embryos. So we're talking about somatic cell gene therapy and gene editing at the moment. So I'll stop here um, and just make the last point again, that access to and participation uh, in clinical trials should really improve the outlook for patients uh, with sickle cell disease. So thank you.